Adam Dunn, Pastor Brandon, and join with Pastor Zach. We are pastors at Westside Reformed Church, a URC congregation in Cincinnati, Ohio. Today we wanted to talk about collection, um, collecting offerings, and, and, and these kinds of things within a liturgical worship service. But kind of broadly, before we kind of get into any sort of specifics, you know, why are we talking about collection? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I've had some uh, personal studies on this recently, and it's uh, something that really fascinates me. And um, there are a couple reasons that I started to undertake this um, you know, t- time of study. And one of them was just the kind of practical thing that I think every church across the world recently experienced uh, during the whole COVID um, thing, where all of a sudden um, the passing of an offering plate or offering bags uh, was suspended, and that caused a lot of um, angst for people. Uh, on one hand, just a practical one of, you know, how does the church uh, function if they're not uh, having a financial collection? And so those who had been collecting within within the worship service proper, they had to make other accommodations. Um, and now that the whole COVID thing has uh, finished, or whatever you want to call it, um, now the question ends up becoming, well, should we return to doing that? I've even heard some pastors say, actually, we kind of like not having it. And so why don't we just maintain not having one in the worship service? And so there's a broadly cultural reason I wanted to kind of in- investigate this. But even more specifically, um, within Westside Reformed Church, we uh, from the beginning did not have a collection within the liturgy proper. We actually chose from the beginning to have a collection box uh, immediately outside of our worship space where you would deposit your um, uh, your offering as you came into the place of worship or as you left the place of worship, and that that would be then how uh, it was done. And so I began to come across some biblical texts that maybe were uh, challenging that um, uh, the direction that I led our church in. And maybe uh, suggesting to me that maybe it was time to revisit uh, the practice. And so both from that kind of COVID-19 angle, but also from the kind of you know, biblical textual uh, angle, I felt like it's been you know, important to, to revisit this topic. Is there anything um, uh, historical within the kind of the Reformed Church that maybe um, kind of got you also thinking about this? Yeah, absolutely. I was um, originally... Um, pushed in the direction of not having a collection within the service proper by prob- maybe my favorite modern theologian and writer, uh, Hughes Alphen Old. I just love the guy. I love his works. I just read as much of him as I can. Uh, but one of the things that he uh, said within, one of the, uh, within some of his books is he really does not believe that there was an offering, a collection, within the liturgy proper among the Reformed churches back in the 16th and uh, early 17th centuries. He's very emphatic upon that. And I, you know, took that and said, okay, well, he knows what he's talking about. He's, the guy is um, uh, just a great scholar. And so, you know, I took that. And um, I think recently, as I've been reading, I realized that he probably wasn't right. Actually, he he wasn't right. (laughs) I was reading from a scholar named uh, Elsie Ann McKee, who's um, a scholar not only of liturgy, but also of social history. And she actually points out that um, the, that the, the liturgies of the 16th and 17th centuries, they didn't include an offering, uh, but that didn't mean that offerings were not collected within the worship service, because you actually have to go to different sources, not just the liturgical forms to find out this information, you need to go to the social history and to uh, records that are being uh, kept within the civil government even, or uh, minutes that were taken by the deacons. And one of the funnier uh, uh, tidbits that I picked up on is that it was actually very common for them to collect the offering in the middle of the sermon. So as the minister is preaching, you would have deacons or maybe one deacon walking around and collecting an offering in the very middle of the sermon as the preacher is preaching. And to me, that's just completely hmm. nuts. I've never heard of something like that, never seen something like that. And hmm. after those collections would be made, they'd be later deposited in front of the congregation as almost like a, 
um, a way of showing them, hey, this is what you do with your money, bring it to this spot, put it into this box. And so there were collections being taken before and after the service, like our practices at Westside Reformed Church, but also being done during the service, even during the, even during the, um, the sermon itself, mm. and at other points also. And so, but those were not things you can pick up from the liturgical forms. You have to pick it up elsewhere. Well, that, that makes sense. And if you're just looking at like their bulletin, as it were, that's right, exactly. And you're saying, well, it just says sermon, but really yeah. in the sermon, the, the, the deacons are going to walk around and collect. You wouldn't pick it up. Yeah. Um, and so, is, is there also is there a distinction between different types of collection? You know, sometimes when we think of collection in our mind, we're thinking of just like a you know a, a general collection. But is there was there maybe differences between maybe a diaconal thing versus other? Yeah, I, I think that there has been uh, for certain, and it's hard to kind of. To, to, to get, you know, splice through some of these things. But I think we probably are um, uh, wise if we begin by thinking about some of the Old Testament um, uh, system of offerings where we have different kinds of offerings that are being offered. You have, at, at sometimes there are food offerings, so animals or grain. You can also have some financial offerings being brought in with the, the various tithing systems. But they weren't just tithing money. They were also tithing food and produce from their fields. And so some of these things kind of get mixed together. But when you look at the different kinds of tithes that were being taken up, some of them are what we might call a tithe in our day. In other words, like 10% that's being given toward like the liturgical budget of your church. Or another tithe, the 10% was being given toward the king his palace and his army that he was raised, raising up. There was another tithe that was an every, I think, three-year tithe that was then, you know, kind of a 3.3% per year, if you want to call it that, that then went toward the poor. So there are different kinds of tithes. I think that probably in the Old Testament, that each year they were actually getting about 33.33% of their, of their um, uh, earnings toward the different kinds of tithes. Uh, but yes, there was a distinction there between the kind of tithe for the uh, Le- the, Le- the Levitical um, uh, system, a tithe toward your own feasting for the feast days, a tithe toward the king and toward the civil government, and then a distinct tithe that was we could call benevolence toward the um, toward the poor, a sort of diaconal uh, uh, consideration. And I think that those different um, uh, considerations were important for Israel. To be mindful that they were um, supporting different things uh, through their through their giving. So similarly, in our day, we give toward the civil government and our taxes, and our government goes well beyond ten percent, of course. Uh, but there is that uh, aspect within our giving. There's the kind of giving toward uh, the church and our liturgical uh, consideration. I think it's also wise to have a, uh, to be mindful that we're not just giving toward the the bottom line budget of our church. But we're also caring for uh, those within the church who um, have mercy needs mm-hmm. and toward the benevolence a- as well. How might that get worked out? It might be worked out in wisdom in different contexts, mm-hmm. in different places, but I think it's important for people to be mindful mm-hmm. that they're not just giving to, to, to the upkeep of a building, mm-hmm. to the pastor's salary. I think they also need to be very mindful that we're taking care of our brothers and sisters who are in, in need as well. Mm-hmm. And so thinking like thematically about like what the offering is symbolizing and, and what what, uh, what what the collection is is doing is there like a, you know obviously maybe not in the middle of the sermon but is there maybe uh, an, an ideal place you can think about and obviously this has to be worked sure. out and polished some but is there maybe like a kind of a, a, a better place for it within the liturgical flow of things in your mind I, I do think so and I think that I could, maybe could say there are better places where it could be put than others I think that as we consider our <clears throat> as we consider our Protestant um, emphasis on uh, gratitude as a response to God's grace, and that God is the one who saves us, and then we respond by giving ourselves as living sacrifices of thanks and of praise. That helps us to then think about how we might conceive of an offering within a service. So I think it should be, therefore, in a place where there's a very clear response to God and that the priority is being given to God and his word, uh, toward God and his gift toward us. 
So maybe two places that could be the, the best would be, you know, for example, after the sermon would be a very, um, I think, ideal place uh, to, to place an offering. Uh, so you're responding to the word uh, preached and you're then giving yourself uh, to God uh, through the emblems of money um, or some other kind of emblem that's being given to, to God as that uh, to, to embody your self-giving. So I think that's really what all offerings were. Whether you're talking about animals or money, it's the offering of yourself to God. And so that could be done after the, the sermon. Um, I've also been in a, a URC church that uh, took up that uh, offering immediately after the Lord's Supper. And so that could also be, I think, a very um, uh, appropriate place uh, to put an offering. Um, and then again, you could still do it if you wanted to outside the service, but maybe more formally as you're leaving the, the worship service right after the benediction. I think that could be an okay place as well. But I think I'm being pushed more in the direction of being within the liturgy proper. Mm -hmm. And I probably prefer the more historical place of doing it right after the sermon and before moving into the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. So that seems to be maybe the, you know, the, the tracks that have been laid by the Christian church east and west across the generations and might be a helpful place place to do it sure yeah what any closing closing thoughts that you would want to say about it or i think maybe just to point out a couple difficulties that we're wrestling through as a council and i'm trying to wrestle through as i'm doing maybe some more in-depth work on it there's the difficulty of moving toward a cashless society mm. and this is not the ideal time to be thinking about having an offering is it so when we are kind of getting away from um, paper cash and coins and even getting away from checks, uh, being moving more toward like online giving only. That's not very uh, uh, helpful if you're thinking about an offering. And so I think that's important just to raise that. That's a difficulty that uh, churches are going to need to consider. I think it's also important to recognize that when we do have these offerings within a worship service, that I think that we could do a much better job of emphasizing the self-giving nature of an offering. That we're not just giving that thing, uh, that money or whatever it is, but you're really giving yourself. And I think that probably could be highlighted more in order that people understand theologically what's going on. You're not just paying for the sermon. You're not paying for the Lord's Supper or something along those lines, some gross transaction. But really, it's that self-offering of a living sacrifice. And that we give by way of those tokens that are placed in a plate or whatever. I think that also um, helps people who might not be inclined to give to actually begin to give if they see it in that theological way. Yeah. That um, where your uh, treasure is, there your heart is also. Mm -hmm. And so we really are giving ourselves to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we're refusing to give toward an offering, well, then maybe we're, maybe we're refusing to give ourselves as well. That's an important question we need to then ask ourselves. Mm -hmm. But I think those are some of the kind of maybe more practical pastoral uh, considerations that each um, body of elders and deacons needs to consider for themselves. And, uh, you know, last thing um, I found to be very helpful from uh, Elsie Ann McKee, uh, she was emphasizing that within the um, Reformed tradition, one of the really helpful things about the offering is that it really gave um, an important place to the diaconate, and it helped to, to bring together uh, worship and piety toward God with charity toward our neighbor. It kind of brings those two things together in order that our worship, our liturgy, which is really you know vertically directed, also has that horizontal component that is part and parcel of Lord's Supper, where we're really loving each other. And so the offering really helps to bring that to bear, that our worship leads to our love. And so I think that the, um, the, the importance of uh, the you know, ministry of word and sacrament with care for the poor and one another is, I think, really brought uh, together, integrated with, with um, an offering as well. So, you know, some various angles there that uh, could be flushed out a lot more, but that's just rapid fire for no, you. No, that's helpful to think about in terms of, you know, the, the, the theological reasons mm -hmm. and the, the giving of yourself, not only for the ministry of word and sacrament, but also for the poor mm -hmm. in terms of charity, also for mission work, mm -hmm. that's and right. to, uh, church planting, developing, all, all of these things. And, you know, wanting to, to give of yourself, mm -hmm. you know, that's, I think it's helpful. And I think within that, one of the, maybe one of the critiques that might be helpful to, um, you know, 
uh, bring this out a little bit more is that oftentimes the Reformed Church is criticized as being too heady. Mm -hmm. And, oh, you, you gather and you worship, but it doesn't affect your life. Well, the, the, the point of this is saying that the offering is one way of really emphasizing this affects real life. Mm -hmm. Because it brings to bear the fruits of your labors and it brings to a liturgical expression the importance of our love for one another mm -hmm. as being the important outflow of these things. And so I think it really helps to avoid that criticism of being an entirely intellectualized or even a Gnostic kind of religion mm -hmm. is to have those tangible things and that, that really um, embody our love that needs to be our proper response mm -hmm. to those um, great and glorious truths. Yeah, and, and even as we're you know, drawing attention to it within the liturgy proper, mm -hmm. Um, it, perhaps people will, will, will be more aware, and, and maybe maybe other people have just been not giving. Maybe they, they don't know where it goes. Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't know what it is. But when you think, you're like, "Hey, I'm helping buy groceries for that for that for that family. Hey, I'm helping this missionary in the Ukraine. Hey, I'm helping the ministry of word and sacrament continue week after week." When you're seeing kind of here, I'm actually supporting this. I'm giving myself, I'm joining arms with my brothers and sisters in order to propagate, you know, all of these great great tasks that Christ has called us to, uh, you, know, you become, I, I think, more excited in doing that. I hope that this has been helpful for you. Uh, again, we are Cincy Reform, sponsored by Westside Reform Church. You can find our previous podcast at cincyreform.org, and we look forward to seeing you next week.